Right, it'll be a little more casual. You can sit closer together. Um, thanks, my name's Gary. Um, we're at Intel now, hence the t-shirt. We um, are very interested in deep learning, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about what we see over the next several years in uh, deep learning, specifically for AR and VR devices. So I'll move to the next slide here. Um, legal disclaimer. <laughs> So the Myriad 2 VPU we launched a few years ago, and so we've had the experience of being able to deploy a chip into the market that's very small. It's about six millimeter on the edge, and uh, we've been putting it into uh, a deep learning prototyping platform that I'm holding up right now. Maybe you can't see it, but it's a USB stick. So to be able to do deep learning and artificial intelligence in terms of, uh, and I'll explain further what deep learning inferences are, we're, our dev kits are very small, very low power, and fit into your, uh, into your uh, host devices of any kind. Um, what our chips do, basically, are three things. They do imaging, they do computer vision, and they do deep learning. And we'll talk a little bit more about why deep learning is growing and sort of taking over in terms of a lot of the algorithms that our chip has to do, specifically in AR and VR devices. We sell to tier one vendors of AR and VR headsets. 360-degree cameras that are used for VR content capture, drones that also need autonomous flight using vision sensing, and surveillance cameras that use a lot of advanced analytics and are moving more and more into using deep learning. So there's a battle going on, and it's a very fierce, fierce battle. And if you watch and you, you're noticing closely, you see computer vision on one side of the ring, and you see deep learning on the other side of the ring. Uh, Classical computer vision is the contender. It's been around for maybe over 45 years. People have developed, been developing algorithms that are kind of human engineered uh, algorithms to track objects or to notice features in objects or to identify a person's face and track the person's face. All of these kinds of human engineered algorithms and filters that are basically uh, single purpose for doing some kind of computer vision uh, technique. Um, so there's been a lot of research and a lot of very effective techniques with very good accuracy. But now on the other side of the ring comes deep learning. Deep learning is basically throwing a lot of computation at um, a, new way of doing, uh, a new way of doing these kinds of classical computer vision techniques. Um, you'll see things like convolutional net neural networks, recurrent neural networks, long short term memory. Um, so all of these kinds of neural networks have a fundamental uh, model of a human neuron, but it's now turned into an algorithm, an algorithm that could take pixels from a large image and put all of the pixels through a lot of neurons and make a lot of individual choices. And at the end, you get a probability that this is either a cat or a dog, or it's some kind of species of animal, or it's a person, or here's the person's face, or this pixel is the person, or it's the background. So there's so many different applications that people have been designing using neural networks. And the interesting thing about it is that slowly over the last few years, they've been taking over for some of the classical computer vision techniques. And we're going to see some of those examples. So where were we a couple of years ago? A few years ago in 2014, deep learning algorithms were now taking the center stage. You could come to conferences like AWE, you could go to Embedded Vision Summit, you can go to uh, CES and see that um, people were running a neural network that could recognize a face or it could track a person. Um, these were portable, so they were able to be transferred into different um, kinds of platforms. And you got good results on speech, for example, and natural language processing. So, um, there was sort of now a center stage being built around uh, deep learning, but they were just uh, starting out. And today, now what we have is uh, surveillance cameras that are very effective. So here we're showing a sample from a high-K vision surveillance camera on the left using a computer vision technique to track people and track cars and vehicles. And on the right, it's using deep learning. And you can see it can identify more vehicles. It has a little bit more accuracy in terms of um, being able to identify even the vehicles that are only taking up a few pixels in the back all the way to the front, and so there's a, um, a bit more accuracy that you can get using deep learning techniques. Um, also, uh, you can you do depth sensing with deep learning. So it's not just about image classification or image recognition. Um, with classical computer vision, you can get a depth uh, heat map like what you're seeing on the left, uh, where using stereo sensors, you can see the um, part of the object, part of the bicycle in red is more close to you, in yellow, it's kind of further away, and in blue, it's much further away. Now, if you use a deep learning technique for taking over some of the aspects of the depth algorithm, you can get a bit more accuracy. You can actually see the pixels in the seat 
and the, um, air, the heat map of the, of the handlebar a little bit more accurate in terms of seeing the break. Uh, so you can get much better accuracy using deep learning. Now there is a cost and there is a trade-off and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But where are you going to see deep learning this year in real products? Um, you'll see it being used for things like object recognition. Um, deep learning is now becoming the state of the art. Uh, um, so CNNs, uh, class, uh, convolutional neural networks, are really shipping for object recognition in surveillance cameras. Um, and even getting into some consumer products for home security. There's um, optical flow and feature extraction. So these are the low-level algorithms that are able to look at the room around you and determine where are those features. Because you need to know that in order to know where the AR or VR headset is positioned. So you're actually knowing the position of the headset in six degrees of freedom, translational and rotational, by detecting and tracking feature points on the wall. And so for these algorithms, um, now it's becoming CNN-based, where it was classical computer vision-based, because now there's more accuracy. And as long as you can throw more compute at the problem, you can get much better and more accurate results. I'm reiterating that quite a lot to, to drive the point home, that the accuracy is very important for some of these algorithms, because as you know, in AR and VR, knowing the position in real time and having very low latency and good accuracy means you're going to um, um, not get as nauseous and you're going to have a more uh, realistic experience, an immersive experience. Then we have stereo and we have SLAM, other algorithms that allow you to track and map objects in the room. Um, SLAM is still very much being done with classical computer vision algorithms and we see that even uh, this year um, there, there's, there's um, really no chance that deep learning is going to catch up maybe this year, um, but maybe in the near future it will be. So we'll move to the next slide. So why is deep learning lagging in some of the areas and really taking over in other areas? There are three real big challenges in deep learning and being able to apply neural networks uh, to do things like uh, imaging, vision sensing, or even language, uh, natural language um, processing. So one is data. So you have to have your hands on really good data sets. You have to be able to build data sets, use them to train the neural network very well because frankly the, the benefit and the accuracy of the neural network depends a lot on the data that was used to train it. Um, and uh, there's still a lot of issues in terms of the, whoops, I'll go back here. Um, there's also the compute and how much compute, I can't go backwards, but I'll talk about the other challenges. Uh, yeah, compute. So how much compute you get per dollar, per watt, per die area, millimeter square of die area, this is a big issue um, because neural networks take a lot of computation, a lot of multiply accumulates, a lot of large linear algebra functions, um, matrix multiplications in order to get very similar kinds of results as you could with a very efficient computer hand-generated computer vision algorithm. So you get a benefit of improved um, accuracy but there is the issue that it takes a lot of computing uh, horsepower. And then there's the issue of algorithms and expertise. So it's kind of a black art. It's becoming a little bit more of a research topic in universities and um, conferences like the Computer Vision Pattern Recognition Conference, CBPR, in the summer is where people come together to talk about new, new uh, kinds of techniques in deep learning. So um, in 2020, in a few years, what are we going to see? We're going to see better understanding of data sets and things like unsupervised learning where you don't have to have labeled data, you don't have to have a ton of pictures of every animal species in order to train a neural network that can de uh, recognize an animal. You can also have, uh, so there'll be much, much more um, work done on the data. There's gonna be much more um, orders of magnitude of computer performance, uh, compute performance that you'll be able to get per watt, per dollar. Um, at Intel, we believe very strongly in providing more performance and giving you uh, improved platforms to be able to do these kinds of new techniques. And uh, algorithms and expertise. You have many more people studying deep learning in universities. So more PhDs means more techniques, which means getting out into actual products and, actual, and uh, real um, head-worn devices with um, better techniques that are more accurate in terms of the deep learning algorithms. And then um, as the gap shrinks over the next few years, where will we see deep learning really flourish? Um, we believe in the Movidius team at Intel that you're going to see it cover a lot of different algorithms. Stereo depth, as you saw with the bicycle example, um, uh, feature tracking, even the image signal pipeline, being able to capture a great image with the raw data that's coming out of the sensor. There's a lot of work being done right now over to use deep learning to be able to get a great image. 
if you have, uh, for a certain sensor, you have known fantastic images and use that to train a neural network, why not let the neural network take over and decide how to tune the whole imaging pipeline? So up until now, it's really been primarily um, done by lots of very, very detailed algorithms at every step of the way, giving you your autofocus and auto enhancement and all of those things. Um, and of course, SLAM, uh, there's going to be new techniques in deep learning. And so we think in the next few years, we'll have a lot of new algorithms and a lot of new applications to handle the multiple cameras that you're going to have in untethered headsets. The AR headsets and VR headsets, that are not tethered to the, to the big machine, but rather have the small compute resources in the headset to be able to track the room, track your gestures, track your eyes, and do a lot of those advanced techniques using deep learning. So I think the winner will ultimately be deep learning, but I do want to point out that computer vision algorithms that are human engineered do have the advantage that they're usually a smaller footprint in terms of performance, and they do have a lot of, uh, a lot of use for people who are doing embedded, battery-operated, small, wearable devices. So um, it'll still be a battle out there, I think, but we'll see deep learning taking over more and more in certain applications. And so I have a few minutes if you want to um, ask a couple of questions. That's it. Thank you very much. Great, let's see if uh, we've had some submissions on Slideo. Any deep learning developers out there? People using deep learning in their AR devices? Deep learning devices? No? <laughs> we have a question here. Yeah, we'll take questions. Let me sure. bring you the mic. I still have two and a half minutes. Uh, do you plan to support TensorFlow? Yeah, the development kits that, that we uh, are working on uh, will be developing TensorFlow and other kinds of frameworks like that. Uh, Intel bought, I think it's, is it called Nirvana? It's a deep A company with an expertise chip. in deep learning, yes. Okay. Nirvana is now a part of Intel. And they're particularly designing chipsets to optimize the ideas that are in that new company? Are they going to be... I can't really speak about Nirvana's okay. activities, but you're right. They are a division of Intel, and you should keep close watch on what they're doing. Okay. At some point, they'll, that may come into the technology that you're building here. I just don't know. Again, I can't say about future... Uh, I don't know. There was something in the small print about what I can't say and what I can't say. Thank you. Interesting question. <laughs> Let me get the microphone over here. Yes. GPU kind of no, it's very different from a GPU. Um, GPUs that tend to be purposed for rendering and shading and then repurposed for doing vision sensing. The VPU that we're talking about was from the beginning purpose built for vision, imaging, and deep learning. So it's, it's a vision sensor chip that's very, very low power, ultra low power for vision sensing. Okay, one last question. Hi, do you plan on uh, releasing dev kits besides the USB stick, the actual like breakout boards and stuff for developers who might not have like high volume applications initially. Um, is that on the roadmap at least? Or? Um, I hear you saying, do we have dev kits? We have dev kits. Um, there's a lot of detail there behind the question, but uh, we should talk after the session. Okay, okay sure. Thanks. All right, great presentation. Thank you very much.